we now wait three minutes. just click on OK, the blue button that just gives permission to record the, yeah. the session. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. We wait three minutes, two minutes more, OK? We'll sure. Give two minutes courtesy time for people to get comfortable. Right. Oh, oh uh, Paloma, Venerable Paloma. Um, I'm going to yes, quote yes. something from Lama Chopa text vale. versus vale, 90, vale. 93 and 94. Vale, I understand. Right. At okay, some good. point. Yes, 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 no problem. Okay. So basically what okay. we're saying is we want a good translation, get the book ready. <laughs> Listo, I have the book ready and especially the 94 verse, I know very well. You have it. <laughs> Boom, memorize. Uh, great. I should let you know that it, it's seven, exactly 7.30 here at Sunday in Adelaide, and this is when I normally take out the garbage. So <laughs> I'll have to leave it for the time being. No, I think it's very symbolic. You have to take out our mental garbage. <laughs> Namely, the self-cherishing thought. Right. Well done. What are you doing, Steve? Uh, faffing, I think the word is in English. Do you, do you use that word in Australia? Not really. I it's like when you're not English. doing anything in particular. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. A Messing few of around. our candles have gone out, these oh. rechargeable candles. Some of the batteries aren't lasting that long, so they go out. Other than that, I'm just making everything symmetrical. Oh, is that two minutes up? No. What, are we, we waiting start. for someone to join? No, uh, no, we can start. I mean, uh, still some people will join, but we can start, I think, already. Eh? Oh, okay. I'll grab my mandala. Wait right there. So um, I'm on now. Yes, Maloma. See, okay. So now it's really important um, to make this time as meaningful as possible. To make this time um, a Dharma action, which means something that it becomes a, a genuine cause of, of of lasting happiness and taking us away from suffering and its causes. Then it's really important that we uh, have the right motivation. So we should check our, our mind right now, check our motivation right now and correct it if necessary. Because sometimes we do things just simply uh, out of habit and so on. So it's really important to uh, 
make our, our motivation really clear and strong, sincere, and of course, to make it the best motivation, which is the bodhicitta motivation. So that can only arise firstly on, on the basis of, of having refuge in the triple gem, of believing in, in the Buddhas, that they do exist, and believing in their teachings, which explain that we have Buddha nature, that we can become Buddhas. So uh, you know, <clears throat> how can one aspire to become a Buddha if one doesn't believe they exist, or if we don't believe that we have the potential uh, within us to become Buddhas? So having refuge is the very basis. And then on that, we need to um, build that, that motivation that recognizes that we've been under the control of the self-cherishing thought during beginningless time, and believing in its lies, thinking it's going to bring us happiness, but actually it's just brought suffering, it's just kept us trapped in cyclic existence. So now we have the precious human rebirth, the optimum chance to, um, to free ourselves from all suffering, to recognize the, the, the very nature, harmful nature, of the self-cherishing thought and to replace it with the mind cherishing others. And, and the basis of that is, is, um, is developing that affectionate love that recognizes the kindness that we've received from not just some sentient beings, but in fact, all sentient beings. Because each day, every moment of this, of this life, we depend uh, directly on so many beings, not just human beings, but beings in the in, in animal world as well. And then <clears throat> those people that we directly depend on or those beings that we depend on directly, they depend on others. So, and this is true for today, all this life, all our previous lives. So it means that we, we, we totally depend, have always depended on all beings for everything, for our, our food, for our clothing, for our housing, for our protection, education, uh, entertainment, um, for all worldly needs, all spiritual needs, everything we've depended on sentient beings and, and their kindness. Right, and especially mo most important of all, we especially when uh, as a human, well, not just as a human being, but especially when we're human beings, we really depend on the kindness of a mother, that incredible, unconditional love, and we have received that from every sentient being, countless times in beginningless cyclic existence. So the more we allow ourselves to be aware of that and to allow it to really affect us, to touch us, to move our mind, our heart, um, then the mind wanting to repay that kindness can arise. And then when we realize more and more how all of these beings are suffering, trapped in cyclic existence, the vast majority experiencing far, far greater suffering than ourselves right now, completely helpless, then that, that bodhicitta mind can arise wanting to repay that kindness by helping every sentient being to be completely free of all suffering that's causes and helping them to achieve peerless, everlasting happiness and realizing the only way I can help them do that is to become a Buddha. There's no way I can do it as an ordinary suffering being trapped in cyclic existence myself, controlled by the self-cherishing thought. I must give up the self-cherishing thought, develop the mind cherishing others more than self. And from that, um, bodhicitta can arise and from that, enlightenment can eventually be experienced. So to help us generate that mind, 
right now, it's really helpful to try and think of all sentient beings surrounding us, starting firstly with our mother on our left, father on our right, then the rest of our family, all our friends and helpers behind us, because you know, out of attachment and so on, we, we, we would like to put them in front of us, be close to us. But uh, to reduce that, we think of them behind us and the people we don't like who may have hurt us in some way that we find uh, uncomfortable to be with, those people, those beings we should put in front, not to generate negative, more negative thoughts towards them, but to realize that they are kind sentient beings, mother sentient beings. They are suffering as well. So they deserve my compassion, not my aversion or indifference. So at least we should try and think of those people, those beings that we are connected to strongly, either in a good or bad way in this life. But then as much as possible, we should try and open our hearts and minds to an awareness and concern for all other sentient beings, all those trapped in the animal realm, present realm, the hell realms, the God realms. Having that sense that each and every one of these beings in essence is only kind, but unfortunately they're only suffering. And as we try to maintain that awareness, uh, also um, visualizing in front of us, if one knows how, it's good to visualize the whole field of merit. Otherwise, the simple form of thinking of Shakyamuni Buddha seated on the lion throne, lotus, sun, and moon, as the embodiment of all the, the, the three triple gem, the triple gem, and it also ones with our own gurus. So, um, so then think to achieve enlightenment. It's all, as, as I've mentioned, it all, it's all about um, developing the mind that is able to cherish others, to cherish them more than self, and completely overcoming the self-cherishing thought. And this, this text, the eight verses of thought transformation, um, gives us ways to be able to do that. So think for the sake of all kind sentient beings, I will study this practice, this, this text, and with the aim to um, put it into practice as much as possible. Sangge Chedang Zoge Chonam La Chanjo Bardo Dandi Kyabzu Chi Darge Chaje Gipe Sernam Gi Drola Panjir Sangge Drupar Shop Sangge Chedang Zoge Chonam La Chanjo Bardo Dandi Kyabzu Chi Darge Chaje Gipe Sernam Gi Drola Panjir Sangge Drupar Shop Sangge Chedam Zoge Chonam La Chanjo Bardo Dani Kyamzuchi Darge Chaje Gipe Sernam Gi Drola Panjir Sangge Drupar Shop So then we can imagine that the Buddha being very pleased with our motivation shows this by now coming to the crown of our head. Firstly, the, the lion throne uh, absorbs up into the lotus sun and moon. The Buddha seated on these now comes to our crown, turning to face the same direction as ourself and then dissolves into blissful golden light. And that light then pours down into us blessing our mind to be able to understand these teachings, uh, these verses correctly, blessing our mind to be able to put them into practice properly, blessing our mind to be able to eventually gain the realization of being able to cherish others more than self. And then briefly, we can do some breathing meditation, such as the nine round breathing exercise. 
just to uh, enhance that positive state of mind, to allow our mind to become a little bit more calm, more clear, more concentrated, so that we can use that more subtle level of mind to listen to and think about the Buddha's teachings this morning. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so, um, right. So our topic is uh, the eight verses of uh, thought transformation. So, um, the Mahayana tradition is distinguished by uh, bodhicitta, the, the developing that wish to... Uh, not just simply become free of cyclic existence, um, but to achieve complete enlightenment. So as an enlightened being, as a, 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 a being with an omniscient mind, um, free of all obscurations, one is able to be of, of perfect benefit to all sentient beings. So, uh, and developing that bodhicitta mind, as I mentioned, it's all about um, being able to cherish others more than self and the, the greatest obstacle to doing that is our own self-cherishing thought so um, in uh, in the Lama Tropa puja that we most of us do quite regularly twice a month uh, in in which was uh, composed by the great um, fifth uh, Oh, I'm not sure which one. No, first Panchen Lama. The yeah. first Panchen Lama. He says um, on verse 93, in brief, infantile beings, which was referring to us, uh, labor only for their own ends, while Buddhas work solely for the welfare of others. With a mind understanding the distinctions between the failings of one and the advantages of the other. I seek your blessings to enable me to equalize and exchange myself with others. So at one point, you know, all those beings who were Buddhas were, were like ourselves, uh, controlled by the self-cherishing thought, but they managed to re understand its harm, gave it up, developed the mind cherishing others more than self and became Buddhas. So, um, and we've failed to do that so far, but uh, this is what we need to do. We need to understand the distinctions between the failings of that self-cherishing thought and the advantages of cherishing others more than self. And in verse 94, it goes on to say, since cherishing myself, is the doorway to all torment. Now, all of our suffering, every, all of our suffering, physical and mental, from the smallest to the greatest that we've ever experienced and ever will experience, it, it's all due to the self-cherishing thought. So since cherishing myself is the doorway to all torment, while cherishing my mother's, is the foundation of all that is good. 
Uh, so by developing that mind of love and compassion and really cherishing each sentient being, seeing them as uh, recognizing them as as mother, as a, as having been our mothers, but also um, being able to recognize that each and every sentient being is in, in, in essence no different from myself in that you know, each and every one of us by every human being every being trapped in the in the animal realm in the predator realm the hell realms and so on we all simply want to be free of suffering yeah there's no difference there's no difference whatsoever. We all want to be free of suffering. Whatever suffering we're experiencing, big or small, we don't want it. We want to be completely free of it. And every sentient being has that same experience. And every sentient being, like myself, just wants to be happy. So that itself is the basis for being able to cherish others um and because when when we see the the similarity the same the essential sameness between ourselves and others then we feel that connection we can we, that there's that basis for empathy and sympathy and so on when you know, otherwise if we see some difference and of course, controlled by ignorance, we see an inherent difference between ourselves and others. Then that's the basis for pride and jealousy and so on, aversion and attachment. And all of those afflictions block the development of, of real love and compassion. Uh, but when, when we see, you know, see, uh, when we cherish sentient beings, then, uh, as, I, as I was saying yesterday, the only way we can cherish them is uh, activating the potential, the, all the potentials of our positive states of mind, of love and compassion, of tolerance, acceptance, uh, affection, and so on, generosity all of those good qualities and, and, and they are the foundation of all that is good. Yeah. So since cherishing myself is the doorway to all torment and while cherishing my mothers is the foundation of all that is good, I seek your blessings to make my core practice the yoga of exchanging self for others. So what the, 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 the first Panchen Lama, the great Panchen Lama, who was the root guru of the, the great fifth Dalai Lama, what he's, what he's saying is that um, if we are trying to uh, not just follow the, um, the Mahayana tradition, but try to enter the Mahayana path to, and follow the Bodhisattva way of life, then what we should do is make the core of our practice the very essential thing the most important thing uh, the yoga of exchanging self for others right. this doesn't mean we can't we, we ignore all the other aspects of the the lum rim because if we really understand the graduated path to enlightenment as i was trying to say yesterday from the very beginning about thinking about the precious human rebirth and so on it's all aimed towards eventually developing bodhicitta of giving up self-cherishing and cherishing others but so but the, the core practice we should try to uh, develop is that yoga of exchanging self for others the the yoga meaning here of developing that that mind where that wish to um, put oneself in the place of others to feel that others are no, no, completely the same as myself 
we need to unify that in our mind, yoke it, bring it together. So it's something inseparable. It's not some separate abstract thought, but it, it needs to be an integral part of our mind. Yeah, that's what the yoga is. Yeah. That's what yoga means, unifying into our mind. So it becomes our mind, part of our mind, a natural part of our mind, that mind exchanging self for others. So how do we do that? How can uh, we um, make this yoga of exchanging self for others our core practice? Well, uh, Langwi Tungpa is, is showing us how we can do it. These eight verses are, are tools by which we can, we can start doing this in our life. So um, just to go back, if you don't mind, because um, as I try to emphasize, to really um, even, even intellectually understand and appreciate what the eight verses are about, um, one really needs to understand self-cherishing, how, what it is, how harmful it is, and what ch uh, cherishing others is and how beneficial it is. So even, you know, and so it's not just, uh, even, even, as I said, even to intellectually understand, appreciate the eight verses, one needs to understand um, the harm, the self-cherishing thought, but especially to practice the eight verses properly, um, you know, so that they really have an effect. One really has to, have got this, have come to some kind of, you know, at least some kind of uh, baby realization that um, I, I don't know what what the, I don't know what what a proper term is, some kind of realization anyway, uh, 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 that my self cherishing is, is terrible. It has kept me suffering in this life. It has kept me limited. It has kept me uh, suffering in samsara. The cause of samsara is our ignorance, right? But what keeps us in, in samsara and what keeps us ignorant is our self-cherishing. Yeah. So the more we really not just intellectually understand it, but have got some, some, you know, some kind of sense of the undeniable truth of that, then that, that will help us to, to practice these eight verses the way they're meant to be practiced. Because as I mentioned yesterday, originally they, the, 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 these eight verses weren't taught uh, to, to any, you know, just anybody. They were only taught to people whom uh, the lineage holders believed this person will really put this into practice, really make use of it for themselves and others. Anyway, um, just before we go on to the eight verses again, um, just to go back a bit about self cherishing. Um, and maybe this doesn't work so well um, because of language, you know, because there's, but anyway, we have this, you know, we were talking yesterday about um, that all selfishness is self-cherishing, but not all self-cherishing is self selfish. And um, I just like to make the point that I, certainly in the English language, I, th I think when we use the word selfish, you know, that has a really nasty connotation. When you say someone is selfish, it's really putting that person down that they are really, uh, you know, only think about themselves. They don't care about anyone. It's got you know, really 
really negative. Um, and and s s of course, some aspects of self-cherishing are really nasty. Because of our self-cherishing, we can do really terrible things, really ugly, uh, horrible things. But in our culture, you know, we've all been you know, influenced by, well, maybe I shouldn't say this, but the, the, the Christian tradition, where there's this concept of evil, things being evil, you know, and, and sometimes people can equate negative karma with being the same as being evil, yeah. But self-cherishing, self you know, self, selfishness, being selfish is like some kind of nasty, a little bit evil thing, but self-cherishing can be nasty and evil, but a lot of it is not nasty and evil, but it's still negative. It's still something we have to, it's very subtle, but we have to get rid of it because it's negating our ability to develop love, compassion. It's negating our ability to experience real happiness and so on. Yeah. I think that's, am I making any sense? Yes, no, few nods. Yes, yes, for sure. <laughs> okay. I was wondering how Paloma's translating that. But yeah, Sorry? I was just wondering how Paloma's translating that into Spanish, but yeah, in English makes sense. Right. Um, by the way, Steve, yeah. I found them. Yay! <laughs> sorry, that's, sorry for the that's other right. people. I was Steve gave me a whole pile of these years and years ago, and I'm never quite sure what they were. I think that's <laughs> and I've only back. found out. Check the anyway, back. Sorry. Uh, sorry, Check back, back. back. I shouldn't off. distract yeah. you like this. Sorry, sorry. Uh, now I've lost my point. Um, yeah. And, and well, the point I'm trying to make here is actually that um, this is one of the reasons why um, we, we often let go. Uh, we we follow so many of our uh, so much of our self cherishing because the self cherishing mind itself tells us, "Oh, this is not so bad. This is okay to do." Yeah. This is not this is not disgusting and evil and wicked, but the trouble is it's still negating our potential. Yeah. If you think, you know, as I tried to say yesterday, uh, the the uh, the um, the essence of self cherishing is attachment, afflicted desire, attachment. It's not exactly the same because self-cherishing is more than that because self-cherishing is really how our mind, uh, you know, under the control of, of on the basis of, of following desire and attachment, we get caught up in all the other afflictions. You know, once, once there's attachment, there's inevitably the potential for anger. If you check your life, every time we got angry, it's because underlying there's some attachment to something, to something, to someone, to an idea. And, and because of our attachment, uh, then we get angry. And once we've got attachment and anger, then we have, there's the potential for all the other disturbing thoughts. So the way all of that works together as one horrible mess, <laughs> that is the self-cherishing thought, at least the gross self-cherishing thought, which is the thing that we should be most concerned about now because we all have it. But the essence of it is attachment and desire. And if you look at the nature of desire and attachment, which always go together, what desire does, it is telling us that, that happiness is out there. 
you know, the obvious message of, of, of desire and attachment is that happiness is out there, that goodness is out there in the external world, and beauty is out there in the external world. That's the obvious message of desire and attachment. And every time we follow it, we reinforce the belief that all goodness and happiness and um, whatever uh, is out and beauty is out there. But the, if you think about it, the secret message of desire and attachment is it's telling us that there isn't anything good inside us. There isn't anything beautiful inside us. Yeah, there isn't happiness inside us. It's out there. That is a terrible message to tell ourselves, which we do all the time. Yeah. And also, and also basically what it's telling us, and, and this is what attachment does, because attachment, as I tried not, sorry, the self-cherishing thought can be summarized as in this little slogan of it's this easy, happy now mentality. By following that, getting addicted to that system of always doing what is quick and easy and what seems to bring some kind of pleasure, happiness, by following that, we are making ourselves weak and we're telling ourselves, oh, this is too difficult. I can't do that. This is too hard. I can't do that. This takes too long. Oh, I'm not capable of doing that. So even these little self-cherishings that we follow, we are reinforcing this belief and, and, and keeping us trapped in this belief in this, that th this is what I am. You know? This limited suffering being this is subject to sickness, aging, and death. That's it. That's all I am, and I'm not capable of anything more. That's a disaster message, which we all believe to some extent. Yeah. But the Buddha is telling us we are Buddhas deep down, or we're potential Buddhas, and we can be of incredible benefit to ourselves and others. We can bring great joy to ourselves and others, but the self-cherishing thought is constantly denying that. So that's not, in a sense, evil and disgusting because it's not hurting anyone else, but it's hurting ourselves. It's keeping us incredibly limited. So why do we follow it? Why don't we do something about it? No. But we have to think about this more and more. We have to be totally convinced that the self-cherishing thought, every, every form of it is, is a disaster, from the littlest to the greatest form of self-cherishing. Having said that, <laughs> having said that, which is a bit heavy, um, we have to, uh, you know, everything is lumbering step by step. So uh, we have to accept that we do have self-cherishing and it's not going to go away overnight, just like that. So, but we, we do have to try to um, oppose it as much as we can. Yeah, but if, you know, if, but we can't do it all the time, so we shouldn't, you know, beat ourselves up about that. We shouldn't give ourselves a hard time. Yeah, the self-cherishing, you know, changing the mind it is very difficult. You know, genuinely changing the mind, making long-term changes to the mind is hard work and takes time. 
and we just have to accept that. Right, that's it. But there's nothing better to do. There's no, there's no option, no choice anyway. <laughs> All the other choices are disasters. Yeah. If you remember, Shantideva says something along, excuse my terrible paraphrasing of the glorious, wonderful Shantideva, but he said something along the lines that, um, you know, the work of samsara is endless. Yeah. While we're in samsara and we follow the eight worldly concerns and the self-cherishing thought, it, it, it never, never, ever ceases because we never get happy. There's always suffering and problems. There's always something to do. Right? It's exhausting. It just, and it never ends. Whereas Dharma, so it's, it's, it's difficult, it's painful, it's suffering, and it never ends, samsara. If, you, if we don't do anything about it, if we just follow the worldly concerns. So practicing Dharma is difficult and it takes a long time, but the point is it comes to an end. And what does it end with? Enlightenment. Yeah. One thing is you work, work, we work our guts out to achieve endless suffering, or we can work our guts out and become a Buddha. Right? There's no choice. Right, okay. All right, I think eight verses. So a quick uh, summary, uh, yeah, of what we've covered so far. Um, so again, as I mentioned, uh, it, it's helpful to think when you read those verses, just to think uh, at the beginning of each verse um, that um, realizing how, how harmful my own self-cherishing is, then um, I am determined to obtain the greatest possible benefit from all sentient beings who are more precious than a wish-fulfilling jewel. So I shall hold them most dear at all times. So this is setting out the basic thing is to, um, to uh, you know, the core practice, which is to cherish all sentient beings, all, you know, friends, enemies, strangers, human beings, non-human beings, all sentient beings, and to hold them most dear and cherish them uh, all the time, not just sometimes, but the goal is to cherish them all the time, not just when they're friend, but also when they're strangers, even when they're enemies. So that's setting the, the whole scene, the, the essential mindset that we are aiming to live by. This is, this is because this is what all the beings who have achieved enlightenment have done. And as I was saying, just to repeat from what I said yesterday, you know, a wish fulfilling jewel can, you know, like if you win the lottery or something, then you can, you have all, all your worldly wishes can be fulfilled perhaps. Um, but um, we, we still have to die, get sick, grow old get reborn in the samsara again and again. So, you know, a wish fulfilling jewel, winning the lottery, having a mountain of jewels is in the long run, not very beneficial, but by cherishing sentient beings, then that is the way 
uh, we need sentient beings to practice. If there weren't sentient beings, we can't develop generosity, morality, patience, perseverance, concentration, wisdom, and so on, to develop all the qualities we need sentient beings. We need them as objects of our practice, you know, to practice patience, you need an object, something that makes you normally upset. So you, uh, to, to develop generosity, you, you need people who need things. So we, we need um, sentient beings as, a, as the object of our practice, but we also need sentient beings to help us in our practice, right? So, um, Stevie? So, hey, Neil. Neil, sorry. Yes. Sorry, it's just, just one, one second. Geshe-la's about oh, to go hi, hi, and he, he hi, was Geshe-la. really to say hello. <laughs> so he's just coming to the call to say a quick hello. <laughs> Uh, okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> is saying that you look very well. I haven't seen you since a long time ago. And looking no. at you in the beast grave, you look very well. I'm happy to see you so well. Yeah, thank you, Gisha. Uh, I've got fatter. I've got fatter, unfortunately. Well, he's very happy to see you. He wants just to come a little bit and say hello to you. And also to thank you for all the effort to teach the Spanish people. You know, the Spanish people has a big relationship with you. I don't know, good connection. They, yes, they... it's very nice. I'm very glad, happy about yeah. that. It's very, no... it's very nice to see Geshla also. Um, it's been many, I hope we can meet again in Valencia sometime soon, yeah. And Geshe-la as well, geshe as well. He, he, he's fine. Right. He's fine. And also he will pray for to meet each other again here in Valencia. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't want to take too much time of your teachings because yeah, it's important okay. for the people. Okay. So just a quick hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, Nasera, interruption. Uh, Neil, uh, one interruption. I go for something that I'm phrasing. Just one moment. I'm really cold, okay? One moment. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm okay, very okay. hot here. Hey, Karen. Yes. Oh. Yes, yes. Yeah. Did you win some scholarship? Is that right? I win. It's, no, no, as far as I know. <laughs> no? <laughs> no I read something about you in the, in, in the news some time ago. Leído algo de... No? Oh, anyway. Maybe Believe it was it. about sorry. Maybe it was about science and philosophy. In the in the FPT news, uh, it was the new of uh, the book that we translated. I think it, maybe it was that. No. 
Oh, maybe. Yes, 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 yes. It was on the FPNT News. Oh, I thought, oh, okay. Anyway, great <laughs> book. Looks fantastic. Congratulations. Okay, sorry, perdón. Okay, back. All right. We're, again? Yeah, starting like again? Back, back online. See? Okay. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, maybe just to reinforce. Um, so, in order to cherish others, to hold them most dear at all times, as I was saying, the basic thing at the very start, at least, is to develop this uh, train to develop affectionate love for sentient beings. Um, and that comes from remembering the kindness of sentient beings. And that comes from, you know, thinking more and more how you know, how much we depend on others in every way. That's just such a simple meditation, but something incredibly beneficial to reflect on how we depend on, on sentient beings in so many, 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 many ways. Yeah? And therefore how incredibly kind they are. That while we're in samsara, we, we depend on them. To get out of samsara, we depend on sentient beings. And to achieve enlightenment, we depend on sentient beings. So they're incredibly kind. And, um, and to realize that you know, we have, we're building up this huge debt of, you know, from, from each and every sentient being. And as I said yesterday, it just keeps growing because each day, you know, we receive so much kindness. And the trouble is, because of our self-cherishing, we often don't recognize that kindness. You know, we don't recognize what people do as an act of kindness. But some, you know, um, people could argue, but um, just the mere existence of other sentient beings is very kind. Just the, just the mere fact that they exist because we'd be awfully lonely and helpless if the other sentient beings weren't around. And people possibly in these days of these COVID times where people get, you know, have been in lockdowns and so on, left but to themselves, then um, maybe people can start to appreciate that just having other, other human beings around is really good. <laughs> Yeah, we are lucky to have other sentient beings around us. <clears throat> yeah. So then it goes on to um, to uh, to say um, when in the company of others. I shall always consider myself the lowest of all and from the depths of my heart hold others dear and supreme. So again, this is just emphasizing how important, you know, how, how we need to cherish others at all times and, uh, and really think of them first, put them first, their, their, um, their needs first. And again, Maybe this is maybe not um, something, I don't know, can cause some controversy. Uh, it, 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 but um, in these COVID times, it's even more important to um, try and think, you know, put the, the welfare of others first because, um, like, by, by things like getting vaccinated, if you know, um, some people can't because of very serious health problems and whatever. But in other work, but in other situations, uh, it seems so important that everyone gets vaccinated. And of course, it benefits us. But one should also think of it in terms of uh, benefiting others, of protecting others. So, as from a bodhisattva point of view. Um, yeah, we should think that way, I, I think. Uh, and like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who is some, and both, uh, both His Holiness the Dalai Lama and 
Lama Zopa Rinpoche have publicly had the injection and um, you know, it's my belief that both His Holiness and Lama Zopa Rinpoche are people who are beyond really getting affected by diseases. They can manifest them. Of course, Rinpoche is manifesting having a stroke. Every time His Holiness goes to Bodh Gaya, he gets a cold, he says. Um, so he's, they manifest becoming sick. But I, I believe that they have reached a point beyond, you know, they can choose to show, appear to be sick or not. They, they don't need to be protected from, um, from COVID at all. You know, they did it to show us that we need to do it. That it's, you know, it's something that a responsible person who thinks about others would, would do. Um, you know, I, I won't go into, there is the story that, that many, many, many years ago, um, when His Holiness um, um, was responsible for this Padmasambhava statue to be put in the in the temple in in uh, Dharamsala, and some people objected to it, saying that Padmasambhava is not a Galupa, you know, is not associated with the Galupa tradition. And His Holiness said, you know, uh, you know, I. I I wanted this statue to be placed in 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 the stoop in the in the temple at Bodga in in uh, Dharamsala, in McLeod Gunge, for the benefit of all the Tibetan people. I I don't need it. This is for the Tibetan people. If you don't want to follow my advice, then there's no point me being here any longer. Meaning he was going to die. If you you know because he, you know, he's supposed to you know the Tibetan people say. He's there for us. He's the, um, uh, and and the Dalai Lama says, "You you people think I, I you know I exist for your benefit, and you ignore what I'm doing. So there's no point in me being here. So I'm leaving." And everybody freaked out, and all the lamas begged His Holiness to live a long time. And eventually, His Holiness said, "Well, if you all come together and recite a hundred million on money per homes, I'll stay." And they did, and he stayed. Yeah. Which shows that you know, his wholeness, if he wants to leave this world, he can do it at any time he likes. Yeah. He doesn't need injections. He's not worried about getting sick. He, he did it to show us something. Same with Lama Zopa Rinpoche. It's about thinking of others putting others first, which is, I'm not saying that if you, you know, if, if the, the, the injection could really harm you because of some condition one has that you, know, you ignore that and, and take it, but um, to only be concerned about you know, oneself and forget the effect it can have on other people, this is um, maybe not so great. Anyway. But the, you know, so the, those first two verses are really establishing the, the outlook. Uh, this is what Lungri Tungpa is saying. This is what, how I am going to practice. And this is something that we can aim to practice. We can make heartfelt prayers to the gurus and the Buddhas to be able to practice like this and try to accumulate the causes that will bring about a change in our mind uh, to do that. But of course, you know, so that, that means sort of meditating on developing affectionate love and, and, and wanting sentient and, and recognizing how kind sentient beings, how much suffering they have, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, also trying to put these verses into practice as well, as much as we can, even if it starts in just very small ways, as a way to you know, just small ways to try to counteract the, the self-cherishing thought. 
so then, you know, the, the, the third verse where it says, again, you know, understanding how harmful my self-cherishing is, um, then I will be vigilant and the moment a delusion appears in my mind, endangering myself and others, I shall confront and avert it without delay. So you know, on the basis of deciding to cherish others more than self, to hold them dear at all times and hold them supreme, then it's what one, what one has to commit oneself to do as much as possible is to take care of one's own mind, to practice really strong mindfulness, to be aware of what is going on in one's mind, to check whether the self-cherishing thought is there. Yeah. And to, to be mindful, to remember how harmful it is and not to follow it not to give in to the, you know, follow the afflictions, but to not only for one's own sake, but for the sake of others to deal with them, to learn the antidotes and so on. Now, I, I didn't mention yesterday, but in the, in the middle section of the Lam Rim where it's talking about you know, dealing with the antidotes, dealing with the afflictions, of course, ultimately, ideally, the best thing is to learn the antidotes um, that will, are able to subdue the, uh, the disturbing thoughts. Also, I forgot to mention that, you know, I, I mentioned yesterday that there are specific antidotes for each of the disturbing thoughts, but there is one antidote that works for all of them if one's trained in it, and that is the antidote of remembering impermanence and death. If we've meditated on, put a lot of effort in meditating on impermanence and death, then this can be extremely helpful as a, a counter agent, as an antidote to all, all of the afflictions, you know, if, um, uh, especially attachment, but to all the afflictions, because you know, we desire something, but if we remember this thing we desire is impermanent, it's not going to last. Um, then if, we've, if we have some real understanding of that, not just the words, because all, all of us Buddhists, we know intellectually, <laughs> we all know about impermanence. We can all say, oh, that's impermanent. But do we really believe it? Do we really live according to it? We, re we really need to meditate on that more and more to get a, a, a real sense of how everything is impermanent, can change, you know, so quickly, uh, come to an end, disintegrate, fall apart, and so on. And for example, uh, uh, when we get angry, we can, re we can remember impermanence that the uh, what is making us anger, angry is not going to last. But also we can remember I could die right now. I could die in the middle of being angry. So this would be the worst kind of death to have, to die with an angry mind. Or to, you know, to die you know, with any of, of the afflictions really strongly controlling our mind at the time of death would guarantee a bad rebirth. So, you know, some real experience of impermanence and death uh, it, it works as an antidote for all of the delusions. But as it, as it mentions in the teachings, and we can discover this from our own experience, that um, uh, to, 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 to generate this, the strength of the antidote, uh, that takes a lot of time and effort. And, and so until that happens, it is also very skillful to, um, it is very important to understand all the things that cause our afflictions to arise. So there are various conditions that, that we have the imprint of all the afflictions in our mind, um, but it's only when certain conditions come about 
that any particular affliction will arise. And one of them, perhaps the most important or certainly the most obvious, is that when we meet the object, when we meet the object of our desire, then desire arises. When the object's not there, the desire is not there, usually. Yeah. Same you know, when the object of anger, some, someone we dislike or uh, disagrees with us is, is present, then anger can arise. When, it, when it's not there, anger is not there. So one way to um, work with the mind to reduce the afflictions and so on is to... Uh, to be aware of what kinds of things and people and situations activate our particular delusions of anger and jealousy and pride and desire and so on, and as much as possible, try to avoid them. Mm -hmm. But since we, you know, uh, we can't always avoid these people and situations and things, that's why ultimately we have to learn the antidotes. But also, the trouble is, even when the object isn't present, uh, if we think about the object, if we think about the object of desire, desire will arise. If we think about the object, you know, people or things that make us angry, anger will arise. If we think about, you know, certain, you know, about ourselves in a particular way in relation to other people, pride arises or jealousy arises so this is why so the the moment that happens you know we have to be really mindful and catch that and let go of that you know if, if we can do it quickly it's easy to let go of it if we get into the habit of really checking our mind of practicing mindfulness yeah but the motivation for practicing mindfulness is not just for our own sake, but I'm protecting my mind it also for the benefit of others, especially for the benefit of others so I don't harm them, so I can also be in a position to be of benefit to them. So also just very quickly, just to remind you, um, other conditions that activate our um, our afflictions is, um, or one of them is just simply hanging out with people who have lots of afflictions. If we hang out with angry people or, or very jealous people or very um, people with a lot of attachment and desire, if we hang out with very worldly people whose who's pre you know, their main, you know, preoccupations are worldly things then we're going to be influenced in that way. That's why it's so important as a Dharma practitioner to have Dharma friends and, and, like, um, uh, and to have a Dharma center that one can go to, to be, you know, to be reminded of what it's all about. I know in, the, in these um, COVID times, uh, people are staying away to a large extent from Dharma centers. Um, but I would encourage people as much as possible to attend teachings. Um, uh, this is one of my little hobby horses, actually. <laughs> that, um, my, that um, you know, here we're doing this Zoom meeting, and I hope what I'm saying is helpful beneficial to some extent but I, I really believe that hearing teachings in person from somebody is far more powerful and effective yeah in, in, yeah it's it's really important yeah um yeah, because when, when, you, when you're in, in the presence of someone, uh, 
oh, I don't know. You're affected by that person more, yeah? And if that person is a good teacher, a good person, then you get the benefit, yeah? But also there's others, just things like when you're in a, in a group with people in front of the teacher, you have to behave yourself more, yeah? Whereas when you're Zooming and things, one can be very relaxed and, and, and whatever, lying around very comfortably, which is all very nice, but the mind isn't you know, being so alert and disciplined as it could be, yeah? And, um, and also there's just the effort of going to the teachings. And that's affecting one's mind. So when you hear the, the teaching, it has more effect because one's put more effort. I remember years, uh, years ago, Lama Sopa Rinpoche came to Adelaide and gave a teaching. Well, the course was for a month. It was meant to be on Mahamudra, but we never got any Mahamudra teachings. Surprise, surprise. Um, but there was an incredible uh, month of teachings. At the, and at the very beginning, and, and where, the, the teachings were held in an in a, uh, old basketball court up in the Adelaide Hills. It was freezing. It's the coldest I have ever been in my life. Anyway, and at the very beginning, the very first day of teachings, Lama Zopa Rinpoche said, he didn't say this exactly, uh, these words, but the meaning of what he said was, I have come to give you a hard time. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> it was freezing and the teachings went on for a very long time. So one had to be really, one really had to want to be there, to stay there. And if you did, you got the benefit. I've always suspected my whole life when I sat listening to Rinpoche teach that he was deliberately being difficult. Hard to understand Rinpoche in the, had, I, I'm, Rinpoche is my guru. I hope I don't go to hell for saying these things. I don't mean them in a disrespectful way, but Rimsha has many mannerisms and used to have many mannerisms in the past. In the earlier days, he used to cough an enormous amount, sway from side to side, and used to teach with his eyes completely. In the early days, he would, wouldn't look at anyone, had his eyes completely closed, which I found quite disconcerting. Many things. And I thought, oh, no, all of this is just to, just to, uh, you know, push us, push our self-cherishing and, and make us practice patience and everything. And then when, when Rinpoche came to Mahamudra, he basically, Adelaide, for this course, that's basically what he said. I've come here to give you a hard time. But for a good purpose, yeah. Just like Marpa, you know, gave Milarepa a really hard time. And as a result, Milarepa became a Buddha. So I'm not, I'm not encouraging you to get COVID and come to the center and get COVID or anything like that. But you know, if precautions are taken and everything, uh, I would encourage people um, to attend. If, you, if you're near a center, support it if you can, yeah. Um, carefully, keeping keeping distance and wearing masks, whatever, whatever. Anyway, anyway, I'm sorry, that's just my personal opinion. Excuse me if I'm no, saying thanks, these yeah. things. Thanks ever so much for mentioning that. I think it's a very um, important reflection. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> that was, by the way, a paid advertisement from. Valencia's uh, director just paid me to say all of that. Um, okay, where are we? Yeah, so the people we hang out with uh, can affect you know our, our minds and how we think and you know so 
that's why it's so good to have Dharma friends, Dharma centers, whatever. And also just also another factor is uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the things we allow ourselves to be distracted by, you know, and in our society, there are so many things to distract us with, with movies and, and TV and, and laptops and, you know, so many, many different things, much of which can be full of you know, stuff about attachment and anger and this and that. Yeah. So if we surround ourselves with this, that stuff, then you know, it it, it can activate our, our our afflictions so easily. You know, you read the newspaper, po po the political section, and you get angry about the politic politicians you don't like, and all this sort of stuff. So one should be really careful. Um, Yes, to to really be mindful what we what one is doing with the mind, protecting it for our own sake, but especially for the sake of mother sentient beings. Okay, so those first three verses really set the tone of the whole practice. You know, Lungri Tungpa was saying, "This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, cherish." Uh, hold sentient beings more dear at all times and uh, hold them supreme. You know, uh, think of myself as the lowest of all, not in a negative way, but just being really cherishing others, uh, you know, holding others up, you know, seeing them as deserving, really deserving um, um, uh, help and support. And that third verse is really saying, in order to do that, then I really, really have to take care of my mind. I have to be practice mindfulness very, very carefully and confront the, the, you know, the, the self-cherishing thought and, and, all, and all its manifestations, such as the eight worldly concerns, and uh, uh, confront it and avert it and you know, deal with it, right? So then in the next few verses, what, what Lumri Tampa um, sets out uh, are a number of scenarios which uh, get progressively more difficult to deal with as challenges to the self-cherishing thought. So the first one is in verse four, it says, and again, uh, one can think, uh, preface it by thinking, uh, understanding how harmful my self-cherishing thought is to myself and others, how it's the greatest obstacle to developing bodhicitta, then because of understanding that, whenever I see beings who are, are wicked in nature and overwhelmed by violent negative actions and suffering, I shall hold such rare ones dear as if I had found a precious treasure. So in the other verses, it was just talking about, you know, I'm going to be nice. I'm going to cherish all sentient beings. So now this gives a very specific example of dealing with sentient beings who are either over, overwhelmed by negative actions. In other words, sentient beings who are particularly nasty people, really controlled by their you know, extreme negative impulses. So Langley Tumper is saying, I'm going to, you know, treasure such people. Yeah. Just as, um, yeah, because it's fortunately, in, in most cases for us, it's not often that we come in contact with such people. Um, so, Things, things that are you know that are that are considered very expensive and precious, uh, such as jewels, are, are are considered precious and and valuable because they're rare. So in the same way, these extremely negative people are fortunately um, rare to meet, 
but they they present an incredible opportunity to put my practice, you know, to see if my practice really works, whether I, I can really um, avoid the self-cherishing thought, which, you know, doesn't want to have anything to do with such a person, right? Uh, that's our one, in, you know, and also you know, we can develop incredible aversion to them and hatred towards them and dislike and sense of pride that well, I'm so much nicer, superior person than this terrible person. So, um, so it's very easy when someone's extremely negative for all of those kinds of thoughts to arise um, and, and extremely difficult to, you know, even pretend <laughs> to like such a person, let alone actually cherish them. So... This is you know, a, a very rare and therefore precious opportunity to try to do those very things of as much as possible, avoiding the self-cherishing thought in, in, the, in relation to such a person and trying to develop some kind of loving kindness and patience and compassion for such a being. Because... If we think about it, the, the, this, this person who is extremely negative and causing so much harm to other people, um, it, it's easy to feel compassion for those people who are being harmed by the negative person. But that, that negative person will eventually, as a result of their behavior, experience incredible suffering. So they actually are just as the, the people obviously suffering now are objects of compassion. So this person who um, is causing the suffering is also an object of compassion. So um, there's this rare, precious opportunity to practice in relation to that person. Yeah. And similarly, uh, Lundry Tumper mentions in that verse, um, meeting people um, who are overwhelmed by suffering. So sometimes you know, um, when, when, when someone has you know, very extreme suffering, that they, they themselves are, are overwhelmed by suffering. When we uh, meet such a person um, because of our self-cherishing, we can't deal with that. It's just too much for us. There, we just can't deal with it. We just often, you may not even want to know about that. You know, it's just I don't want to know about this. It's too much. Yeah. But again, uh, here is a rare and therefore precious opportunity to confront one's own self-cherishing, which always wants to be happy and see nice things and happy people and for everything to be nice and comfortable and for oneself not to be uh, reminded of one's own inadequacies and whatever. Here's a chance to face all of that and and somehow um, be in the presence of this suffering person. It doesn't mean you know that we have to go and end their suffering, and but we somehow just being able to be there with that person rather than running away. This is a rare chance to to um, you know confront the self you know confront one's own self-cherishing that what doesn't want to deal with such difficult situations and to you know really somehow cherish this being 
So I think it's almost nine o'clock, right? So yeah, before we, break. Uh, is, is there a question? Oh, remember, I, I should say again, if we're meditating on this, uh, on on this verse, you know, it's also good at the, you know, because especially if we say, as I said, Lungri Tampa says, I will do that. Then maybe it's more accurate, more honest for us to say, may I be able to do this? You know, requesting the Guru Buddha, and therefore imagining the Guru on one's crown, um, sending this blissful white light and nectar, purifying our, our obstacles to being able to do this, then sending gold light and nectar, blessing our mind to be able to have it, to have the courage and the, the strength and the compassion and wisdom to be able to do this practice. So is there a question existing? Yet? See, there is one question. We, we do now. I read for you now yeah, the question. Got vale. Five minutes. Vale, one moment. I'm yeah. going to check the question. Moment. Steve, la leo en castellano y la traduces tú, ¿vale? Y dice, eh, pero ponte en español. Hello, I... Yeah, she's saying it in Spanish. Steve? Long. Yeah, mate. Vale, eh, ¿la tienes Steve, la pregunta? No, porque... Claro. No ¿La puedes esto? poner, Paloma, en el chat de Steve? Que no, es muy larga. Tú, Espera. No, no, es larguísima. Eh, es... What a long question. Eh, yes. ¿La puedes poner tú en el chat, Paloma? Yeah, I didn't switch over to the Spanish channel quick enough, so I missed the beginning part. Te la van a poner en el, en el chat, Steve. It seems it's coming over in the chat. Let's see. And if not, we'll just wait till after the break. Okay, here it is. Mm, quite a long one. Maybe we'll wait till after the break. We'll leave it till after the yeah. break. Sure. All right, okay. Get the what? And give it to you after. Okay, dog. <laughs> right. I think there's another one, maybe a shorter one. A quick one? Is there a quick one, Paloma? I think she's reading it in Spanish. You can see her mouth moving. Chuckling. Uh, sorry. The other question is how to deal with people that are really suffering, personas que sufren, but uh, the, people which are really suffering because they want to attract the attention of others. A ver. <laughs> but... to, to attract, like, um attract the attention of others in what way they want to be like popular and famous and well known and or attract the attention like meaning uh sexually attract other people or what it seems to be how to deal with people who are basically showing off <laughs> I have no idea. Um, <laughs> How to deal with those sort of people. So maybe it's not someone who's criticizing you directly, but someone who's yeah, showing off, trying to get the attention of others. Uh, well, uh, 
it's not our job to to uh, ch change the behavior of others. You know, if we just have to practice patience with them, I think. Yeah. The, the teachings are about uh, applying to ourselves. You know, we need to apply the teachings to ourselves and not sort of to other people. Um, we just have to accept, I think, that that's the, 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 the character of that person. Yeah, I think spot on. Thanks, Neil. Do you want another quick one? Well, I hope this might be quick. Uh, uh, no, no, it's nine o'clock now, so we should yeah. take a break, I think. I hope I'm not exhausting it. People's no, it's brains just, are popping. Okay, so we'll take a half hour break. Yeah, sounds good. Oh, no, sorry, it's not nine o'clock. It's nine o'clock here. I don't know what. Half what is it, 11? Yeah. Half past 11. <laughs> it's time for a tea and a biscuit here yeah <laughs> okay see you later see you in half an hour yep thank you Neil <laughs>